Hi, and welcome to the Off the Charts Football Podcast for this week. I'm Mark Simon. Matt Manicharian will join me in a second. March is Women's History Month, and for our final show of the month, we wanted to do something on women in football with an SIS twist to it. First, we'll be joined by ESPN's Mina Kimes. Mina is a highly popular NFL analyst at ESPN. You can see her on NFL Live, hear her on the Mina Kimes show, and read her work on ESPN.com. Her work is very much in line with ours. Then we'll talk to Robin Ritchie. Robin's one of us, a sports statistics researcher. She's based in Vancouver. She did some in-depth analysis on punt returns for the Big Data Bowl. Robin's work represents the future of football analysis in more ways than one. Hey, Mina, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. We got to talk basic football stories. Do you have a favorite off-season story? Well, as a Seahawks fan, it's definitely not trading away the best quarterback we've ever had in the history of the <laughs> franchise. But no, I, you know, obviously the quarterback mobility this offseason has been fascinating. What it says about the state of the NFL, I think how GMs operate, teams approach roster construction. And of course, the perceptions of this year's draft class are all kind of folded into that. But I, I've also been really fascinated by the wide receivers getting paid and the amount that they've gotten paid. It's something I did not anticipate in part because I actually like this wide receiver draft class. I think it's pretty deep. But also, you know, we're talking about older wide receivers getting paid. And my good friend Bill Barnwell had, I think, a good comment on it when he said, Bill O'Brien trading DeAndre Hopkins permanently altered NFL history forever. I think that's right. I, I kind of want a 30 for 30 on that trade in that moment. But, you know, I, I like these trades because I think, and I'm talking about, you know, Devontae Adams, Tyreek Hill. I think you can really mount interesting arguments for both sides. And those are the kind of trades I like. Not the DeAndre Hopkins trade where everyone and their mother agreed it was absolutely horrible for Houston. But with these trades, I think you can really see the case for both teams. And that makes it more interesting to me. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's like, here's my present value, Russell Wilson, for some future value. As opposed mm-hmm. to just like, you get everything good and I get everything bad. Is there one NFL draft related thing that you're looking forward to? Well, you know, I go back to the aforementioned, much maligned quarterback class. I think it absolutely perceptions of this class influenced what we've seen, you know, with teams like, obviously, I would actually throw Denver out because I think if you get a chance to trade for Russell Wilson, you just do it. But more looking at like Washington trading for Carson Wentz, Pittsburgh signing Mitch Trubisky, which I don't think should stop them from considering a quarterback, by the way, you know, Indianapolis trading for Matt Ryan. I think all of those moves speak to how the NFL regards this group of quarterbacks, money talks, trades talk. I also think, though, that I had time to watch all of the kind of ostensible first, second rounders as much as we can criticize them and argue some of them have too low floors or too low ceilings. Every year, some quarterbacks can get drafted higher than we think. And so I think it's just really interesting to see how that shakes out, especially because the quarterback that a lot of people have going first overall, Malik Willis, is an absolute roller coaster. And with the, you know, I, I would call him a low floor, high ceiling quarterback. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, I think you're spot on. It, it matches our evaluations in the NFL draft guide that we're putting out. He's the only guy that really you could see kind of ascending to be like that top level, like the, like you said, the high ceiling. Whereas there, there are a couple of high floor prospects, but where does that really get you? Like where does Jalen Hurts get you at the end of the day? I think that's something that, uh, you know, in response to, it's funny, we've, we've had conversations this week about uh, how the infamous, now infamous Bills Chiefs game changed overtime rules. I also think it wouldn't be overstating it. To, it. It changed how teams feel about the quarterback position. You know, when you watch these guys, it's really hard to imagine yourself going deep into the playoffs with a Trent Dilfer type or Alex Smith or whatever. And so I think teams are maybe more willing to place a bet around a toolsy quarterback. The show has the women in football theme to it. And right on cue, the NFL yesterday, an announcement, Roger Goodell had previously said that he was dissatisfied with the league's progress on a number of diversity-related fronts. He's trying to do something about it. So for 2022, all 32 NFL teams will hire an offensive assistant who is either a female or a member of an ethnic or racial minority. The person will be paid from a league fund, and the coach has to work closely with the head coach and the offensive staff, the goal being to increase minority and female participation, create better pathways to head coaching jobs. What did you make of that? I think it's a passive, it's pretty overt acknowledgement by the NFL that the Rooney Rooney World isn't working, that they have to be more proactive, say, hey, here's money, and you have to do this. And also, it's pretty targeted at 
increasing the offensive pipeline, which is something that we talk a lot about a lot when we talk about the absence of not female, but I would say black offensive coordinators and about the fact that teams in recent years seem to be going more to the offensive side of the football when hiring head coaches. So this seems to me pretty specifically oriented to address that. I don't think it solves it because I think that the absence of diversity in the NFL's highest levels cannot be solely attributed to the lack of offensive pipeline. Frankly, you know, when we see every year non-white offensive coaches getting passed over, it, it's obvious that that's not a solution in and of itself. But I do believe that Roger Goodell and the NFL, like they, they, they take this seriously. I do. You know, I, I'm someone who criticizes the league a lot, but I think this is one issue where there's probably frustration in the league when it comes to the team's side of how they've handled this. And of course, that ultimately goes all the way up to ownership. Yeah, they're, they're taking it seriously. It might have taken the Gruden lawsuit and the Washington football yeah. team or whatever we're calling them now and all that stuff. But now they care and they have a mm-hmm. lot of millions of reasons to care. OK, so we talked about it kind of from the perspective of black coaches with Jeremy Duru about a month ago. We had him on and we really dug into the Rooney rule and that side of things, specifically with women. What have you seen regarding the evolution of women in football on the coaching side, management side, kind of behind the scenes, that sort of thing? Well, I, I think you've really seen some pretty impressive growth there. Now you're going from like zero to 12 or whatever. So it's not hard to achieve a pretty high growth rate. But, you know, certainly just seeing women like Jennifer King with the with Washington, Lori Locust with Tampa Bay, just rising around the league. And then, of course, in the front eye side as well, it's very obvious that there are gains being made. And you know, as someone in the media side of things, it's really heartening to watch because this is, I mean, like I said, we're going from really zero to double digit figures in, in a matter of just a few years. And I think that's really encouraging. You mentioned the media. There's yourself, Lindsay Jones, certainly at The Athletic, president of the Pro Football Writers Association, among the most prominent media people in the country covering football. What growth have you seen in the media for women for football? Yeah, I think on the beat reporter, blogger, podcasting side, you're continuing to see gains. And my hope is that that'll feed into what I do, which is, you know, more on the analysis side where our ranks are still pretty, pretty small. So, you know, I started my career as a writer, a futures writer, not a reporter, but I think similar to our discussion about coaches, it's all about building pipelines for opportunities. And, you know, a lot of analysts who aren't former players do get their start in radio, in podcasting, in writing. So just to have more and more women in visible positions in those roles will inevitably, or hopefully, not inevitably, I never say inevitably, uh, hopefully lead to more women doing work like the stuff I do for ESPN. I read an article that Lindsay wrote, I mentioned her just before, it was written today, don't you dare look behind the curtain, the curtain sure is beautiful. The theme was basically that the NFL promotes its excellence, but there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes going on that's that's ugly. There's Sean Watson, Daniel Snyder, Gruden, as, as Matt mentioned, the things that the Washington Post expose shed light on in uh, Washington. How would you rate the NFL in terms of actions versus <laughs> words? Well, I think you went into a similar issue that you do with diversity in hiring, where some of it is on the NFL, but a lot of it is on the teams themselves and the NFL's ability or inability to regulate those teams' behavior. I think the Cleveland situation with Deshaun Watson being an excellent example of that, right? You know, ultimately, 13 teams pursued Deshaun Watson, despite the fact that there were all these civil suits pending and also, you know, had been stories reported, gathering kind of anecdotes, including, you know, one from a woman who didn't sue, that kind of thing. And ultimately, uh, the Browns decided to make him the the highest, given most guaranteed money in the history of the league. That's not something, you know, that the NFL did while this was pending, which, by the way, I I think it's important to know when we talk about Deshaun Watson, the argument, at least from me, isn't this is a person who should never play football again or have a job again. The argument is, wow, a team just (laughs) made him the highest paid player while all of this is still out there. And I think those are two very different things. And sometimes they get conflated to promote bad faith arguments. That said, the NFL could have stopped it. You know, they could have put him on the commissioner's exempt list at any point. They didn't for a variety of reasons, including their own investigation and, you know, the situation in Houston. But they are not blameless when it comes to the handling of this and the outcome of this. And I think that's something you see a lot time and time again. Now, the Snyder story with 
Washington. That, that That's entirely on the NFL. I found the NFL's handling of the issue, the punishment of him to be entirely inadequate based on what's been reported to say nothing of the fact that the actual report was not publicized or even written. I think that speaks volumes about how they wanted it to go away. And I think that's frankly pretty disgraceful. He got about as much a punishment as Robert Kraft did for his own incident, which I don't forget has some similarities to the Deshaun Watson saga, although a saga that is, and that's a whole different thing. Yeah, I will know. This does come up a lot. You know, Kraft wasn't accused of non-consensual misconduct. That's fair. So yeah, I, that's I very fair. It's a pretty significant distinction. Yeah, well, Snyder so, was, by the way. So that that there the, 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 that is where you start running into a, like a more of a clear comparison for me. So just to wrap up here, and this is something that we talked about with one of our other guests, who is a football researcher, essentially doing hardcore, intense data analysis. We asked her. What advice would you have for the students or to the mothers and fathers whose daughters say, I want to be the next Mina? You know, if you have a daughter or anyone, I think anyone who's not typically represented, you know, in media or in teams or whatever, with a passion for the sport, encourage it, facilitate it, uh, make them think it's possible that it's a thing they could do for a living. I know for myself, you know, in many ways growing up, I didn't think I would ever work in and around sports because I didn't see that representation, but that was countered by the fact that my parents were really encouraging of my interest and, you know, gave me my dad, for example, bought me Sports Illustrated, took me to games, watched games with me, explained things to me when I was really young. And, you know, that was so integral to my even believing it was a possibility, even though it didn't manifest itself until a little bit later in my career as a writer. And so I think, you know, it's it, it's not a dissimilar. I mean, I don't have kids, but it's not dissimilar to, I think, any passion you want your kid to pursue, just making it clear that it's not just a dream, but something that could be turned into a reality. That's great that there are examples like Mina Kimes that we can point to. Mina, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you to say. Robin Ritchie is a PhD student at the Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. She's pursuing a doctorate in statistics and was a finalist at the 2022 Big Data Bowl run by the NFL. Hey, Robin, thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Let's start by getting a more descriptive biography. Just tell us a little bit more about yourself and what your background is as it relates to sports and football. Yeah, so I'm definitely a student of the game a little bit, so I'm did my master's at the University of Manitoba, where I worked a little bit with some soccer event-based data, trying to model kind of when teams are most likely to score goals and could come use that to kind of compare home and away performances for teams. And now I'm kind of transitioning into my PhD, where I kind of want to break through in the statistics of curling. And along the way, I want to do as much as I can with like other types of data, like the big data bowl was a great aspect to incorporate tracking data in football. That so, yeah. sounds so fun. Tell me about curling analysis. I want to know everything. <laughs> um, it's definitely like there's not there's not a lot out there. Everything that's kind of curling related is very like end by end information, kind of like how you'd have innings in baseball. It's just kind of like a summary of how that all went. I kind of want to take it further as like a shot by shot. Are these teams making the best decisions at the right time? Yeah, they, they don't have, so they don't have shot by shot data. That's or that's new. It's still like human tracked kind of. So it's uh -huh. someone in the stands with a distorted angle of the shots, like recording it on an iPad and then sending that. So it's it's not great data and it right. needs to be improved. And then it's also very complicated to deal with just like the physics behind the sport mixed with like human execution mixed with like what's the proper decision. It's complex for sure. But there's a decision aspect, and then there's also an execution aspect, and you have to kind of parse that out somehow. Mm -hmm. I feel like that, that relates to, to football well, too. There's the decision aspect and the execution aspect. So, yeah, I think sports, right? Yeah, big data ball. <laughs> Why don't you walk us through what you did for it? Because I think what you, what you did is pretty cool. Yeah, we yeah. already moved on from the big curling bowl. <laughs> Maybe one day there'll be a, a curling bowl. Yeah, so this work I did was in collaboration with three other Simon Fraser students. So I'll give them a quick shout out, Elijah Kavan, Riker Moreau, and Brennan Kumagai. And we did a project called Pound Returns using the math to find the path. 
So we basically, for punts that are returnable, um, we outline the safest path for returner to maximize return yardage with the end zone as their target in mind. So the path is based on how quickly defenders can fill the gaps in the coverage, as well as the blocking ability of the return team. And we prioritized forward movement as opposed to lateral movement. And we wanted to determine how well a power turner could perform above what we expected of them in that current situation. So this is pretty cool research. And it's actually the kind of thing that's very much up our alley, even though we may not have necessarily attacked it yet. And I think of it like almost as like the punt returners got to go through a maze, right? Like they, in order to, to reach their intended goal. We talk about optimal paths for outfielders to get to fly balls. That's a common thing for baseball. You established a framework for an opti- optimal punt return path. What did that entail? Yeah, so it's definitely different than it would be like in baseball. It's a little bit more complex as there's like two teams all moving at once, kind of trying to fill each other's gaps and find all the stuff. So it's moving parts, lots of obstacles that the punt returner needs to take into account like instantaneously. So what we did is we looked for kind of like a graph theory solution that could find the safest gaps in the kick team's coverage for the punt returner to kind of target and move through safely. And it's definitely, it's a weighted scheme between how safe that move is and how much does that actually help you gain yards to get to that end zone. So it's basically, just so I'm understanding, it's basically looking at things on a move by move basis, like as opposed to considering this one long path versus this other long path. It's kind of going from like a moment to moment, like, are you increasing your safety and amount of yardage that you've gained? So we look at it frame by frame and we try to find the safest path all the way to the end zone. Like in reality, everything's going to change every single instance. So we really only like evaluate their decision based on like the next five yards of their movement. Cause that's like kind of our idea was just like, how far can the punt returner see future movement? So we only actually evaluate them on the next little bit as opposed to the entire distance to the end zone, but it's definitely cooler to find the safest path all the way to the end zone. So this is something that like an assistant coach could use in an instructive way to, to basically say whether or not a punt, a punt returner was getting the most out of what he was trying to do, right? Yeah. So it's definitely something that we kind of intended as like a review type analysis. So you can look at the play and notice which gaps were like open. There was your blocking team was helping you. There was a gap there that you clearly missed. So we were able to see that for a couple returners and it can definitely use to kind of like shake them a little bit and say like, you're missing these constantly. You're always going to the sidelines, but it's definitely like it's a weighted scheme. So some punt returners are more crucial in their other role right on the team. So it's, they kind of take the safer route than Maybe what is best in our algorithm would say is maybe a little more dangerous, a little more risky, but we hope to maybe one day kind of be able to adjust the weighting based on maybe a prompt returner's preference. If we want to find maybe more of a safer path or one that gains more yards because you're on, it's the very end of the game and you need that touchdown or you need those extra yards to be able to weight it a little bit more on the situation would be definitely a future direction for it. So you said a couple of things there. I want to make sure I remember them because you had me interested. The idea of like a risk aversion, like that definitely makes sense to me. You have returners that are more explosive. In fact, most teams will have a different returner that they'll put in, in what you call a punt return safe situation. Mm -hmm. And that's the person, you know, is going to catch the ball. He's going to get five yards and go down, whatever. And then you Mm -hmm. have your guy that you put in that, that, you know, is your game breaker a lot of the time, something or somebody you even save. Maybe it's a starting receiver that you don't like to use unless you really need it when you're down. So yeah. I think that aspect's really interesting. You were talking about running up the middle versus going towards the sideline. And I noticed on the example from the big data bowl, the return went right up the middle, kind of kind of split everybody right there. Mm -hmm. How much of that did you find with your model versus was it also telling people to kind of pursue trying to get the corner or not as much? It definitely favors the center of the field, but it does sometimes find those safest areas kind of moving around and going along to the sides. But again, that's in like the way that we weighted it. So we could weight it. So it's a little more eased in terms of lateral movement. We really like wanted to gain yards on the play was our goal. 
was to show you how can you gain yards, but definitely changing that weighting scheme could allow for more lateral movement in the play. You also created a yardage over expected stat as part of this. I'm curious mm-hmm. who, came, who came out who came out best. Deontay Spencer was our top ranked in terms of return yards above expected. Cool. That's that's great that you were able to do that. You said off air, you're just a beginner. What do you want to do in, re- in research, both on the football side on, and on the curling side? Yeah, so step one, I definitely want to, myself and my team, want to elaborate this project and try to add in more player details where you can get a little more specific to certain players' preferences or tendencies, as well as like how good certain blockers might be, where we could incorporate that throughout our model. Um, That's cool. So you're saying you would be incorporating like player skill into the model somehow. So like, what would that look like for a returner? I, I think of like a faster returner might be different than a, is that, is it something that yeah. simple or is it even more? Uh, definitely at the first level is, is speed. So we kind of gave everyone a constant speed, whereas you can with the tracking data and we have, we had more time, we could incorporate the actual speed that they're moving at each instance and in their acceleration into the movement. So be able to better tell how far they can get faster than maybe a slower person trying to tackle them or right. kind of incorporating that. That sounds really interesting. Yeah. After that, just adjusting the weighting for each player and possibly making something like a shiny app where you can look at different punt returners in different roles and being able to weight it based on the user's preference would be really cool. And then ideally get it in the hands of some NFL coaches or Canadian football coaches too. That would be a, that would be a nice step. Yeah, that would definitely be something that could be useful for the future. Are you a CFL fan? Yeah, I used to volunteer for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers for 10 years. So. Nice. Go Blue Bombers. I yeah. like it. <laughs> <laughs> They're finally hitting their stride now after a long time. <laughs> Our CEO is in Toronto, so I, I don't know that he would necessarily... <laughs> Agree. Uh, <laughs> Might edit that out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So, so lastly, here, what would you say to someone who says, "I want to do the kind of work that you do"? Definitely get started in like things like hackathons. So, the Big Data Bowl is a, a super place to start. If you're into hockey, there's the Big Data Cup, which this year is focusing solely on women's hockey and trying to improve that game, which is super cool and very awesome. There's also like lots of area on on Twitter and groups that you can just kind of join where they kind of just talk about the game, talk about analytics and how to incorporate the two. And it's it's a great place to start for sure. Where can we find you on Twitter? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter at RR underscore sports stats. I think that curling has no idea what's about to hit it. I feel like this game is about to be changed completely differently because of what Robin's about to do there. I don't know. Am I onto something, Robin? We'll see, you know, talk to me in uh, five years and we'll, we'll see where I'm at. <laughs> nice. Robin Ritchie, PhD student at the Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And this wraps up our podcast episode for this week. Special thanks to our guests, Mina Kimes and Robin Ritchie. For Matt Menacherian and our producer, Justin Stein, I'm Mark Simon. Thank you for listening.